brilliant. Um, thanks, everyone. Obviously, great to have such a, <coughs> a, a full room tonight. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm here to uh, speak about the Jake Morgan Global Core Real Asset Fund. Uh, investment trust has been going five years or so. Um, and from now on, I'll call it Jara by its ticker. It's obviously a bit less of a mouthful. A um, bit about me. So Philip Waller, I've been with JPM for about 10 years now. Most of that within the private markets. Um, and I'm part of the investment team that manage uh, the vehicle. So I want to get straight into it. Obviously, you've got kind of 20 or so minutes and then a few questions at the end. So just wanted to start with, you know, what is the fund? What are we trying to achieve? Um, and you know, ultimately, what we've looked to build with JARA, um, say launching it back in 2019, is really a kind of cornerstone allocation for investors within their kind of real asset or within their kind of diversifier bucket. Now, how do we get that kind of cornerstone quality? Well, I think firstly, it's through the diversification of the portfolio. So we are not just a focused or niche sector orientated real asset vehicle. As you can see, we are diversified across what we kind of consider to be really the three big kind of food groups within the real asset market. Real assets being kind of hard assets, such as real estate, infrastructure and transport. Um, within that, you've got obviously a lot of different sectors that we are then also diversified across. Uh, and then importantly as well, we are a global vehicle. And that's one of the things that makes us relatively unique within the, the broader investment trust landscape, where you do often have quite UK-centric or, or at least kind of UK-orientated vehicles. Um, and actually, we are truly, truly global. We only have around 3% in the UK. Now, why is that important? Um, that's important because one of the key drivers of risk and return when you think about these hard assets is often what's going on in the local market, whether it's kind of um, regulatory dynamics, political risks, etc. cetera. Um, and really, with our portfolio, we allow investors to diversify that. Um, as well as being well diversified, the other thing that's important for that foundational quality is really our focus on what we kind of call core assets, as we kind of say in the title. And importantly, core assets are the, what we believe to be the higher quality end of the spectrum, so more income orientated um, assets that typically derive the majority of their return from some sort of forecastable or contracted uh, income stream. So collectively, we're looking to put them two together, the diversification as well as the, the core focus to build our cornerstone allocation. We do that by utilising the JP Morgan platform. I'll talk about that more in a second. So allocating towards the existing private strategies, the existing private vehicles we have on the platform, and then collectively over the long term targeting that 7 to 9% of which you know, roughly two thirds, 4 to 6% comes from income. Now, um, so how, how do we come to this? How does you know, JP Morgan look to build such a, a portfolio? Um, so I just wanted to quickly touch on the platform because that is what we use. So you can see on the right hand side, we manage over 200 billion uh, when it comes to alternative assets. Alternative assets being really anything outside of public equities and, and public fixed income. Um, we've been doing it for 60 years. You know, unsurprisingly for us, we started with US real estate and then we've added and diversified into different parts of the market uh, since then. Uh, and importantly, you know, what we are focused on with JARA is really the real asset portion of that platform. That is real estate infrastructure and then also some liquid real assets as we highlight. And importantly, that's roughly 100 billion plus of the platform. So it is an important part of what we do. It is probably what we're best known for, as I said, with our kind of heritage in, in certain parts of the market. Uh, and then my team sits on that platform, the alternative solutions team. You know, we've been going for roughly 12 years and we really sit in the middle of that pie chart. And our job is to build diversified portfolios with the target of producing a portfolio where the sum of the parts are greater than the parts individually uh, and then obviously deliver the outcomes that we're targeting. So why is it important and why do we view a field that's really important even, you know, in particularly in this market environment for investors to continue and to allocate towards the real asset market? Um, and, you know, it's a bit of a cheesy acronym, but we do feel there's that kind of aid um, that they can bring to the portfolio. So firstly, given the focus on uh, private markets here, 
we do feel that kind of this real asset mix can deliver some return premium over the long term to uh, public markets. Uh, importantly, I think the story with you know, general real assets, and we'll talk about things around discounts later, but general real assets uh, has evolved over the last few years as interest rates have increased. You know, I think several years ago, maybe three or four years ago, one of the big focus for investors when they come to markets like this was just income. You know, if I can get a 5 6% income, that's good. Obviously, the interest rate environment has changed, but importantly, um, not all income is created equal. You know, if you look at Java's dividend yield right now, we're somewhere in the mid sixes. That is relatively attractive, but importantly, that income stream isn't um, necessarily as linked to interest rates as some other parts of the market, like cash, like bonds. And so, even as that does start to go down, we would expect it to be stable. But importantly, there are qualities to that income given its contracted nature um, that can be beneficial over time, such as the inflation linkage that we'd expect to get from some of these assets. And then finally, and what I think is really, really important for this type of the market, is the diversification of these assets. You know, talking about allocating across markets such as real estate and infrastructure. You know, in infrastructure, we own, and we'll talk about it later, um, a decent allocation to renewable energy. You know, the drivers of return there are, you know, whether the kind of wind is blowing and the sun is shining on them assets and generating electricity, that's a fundamentally different uh, driver of return than other kind of more public markets or other asset classes. And so over time, you do expect to get a, a decent level of diversification. You know, you've got the traditional correlation matrix on the right-hand side. Green is good, less green or kind of red, not so good. You can see that generally it's a pretty green picture. But importantly as well, a lot of these asset classes are diversified against each other. And so com combining them in a diversified and cohesive way like we've looked to do, hopefully gives you a double layer of diversification and really hopes to tick uh, all of these boxes. So I've talked about it being diversified and global. Um, just wanted to kind of you know, prove that and I, I can't promise not to talk about it again, but you know, generally kind of show what we mean by that. But you can see you know, Jara, say five years or so, in existence, roughly 200 million in NAV, um, we actually are able to access over 1,400 private real assets. And we get that because we are utilizing the existing private vehicles, the existing private strategies that are on the JP Morgan platform to get a significant level of asset level diversification. And so some of the kind of more idiosyncratic uh, asset risk and counterparty risk that's often uh, happening in this space uh, we feel we've well diversified. When we say it's global, we mean it. 56% in North America, 18% uh, Europe, uh, of it, or which 3% UK, 26% in Asia Pacific. And then importantly with that comes a kind of a well diversified currency mix as well, primarily dollar and then a partial hedge in sterling. So that's kind of the broad picture. Now to get on to how are we allocating it, where are we allocated and what are we exposed to? Now, I think importantly, there are, in many ways, two layers of portfolio management going on within, within the vehicle. So my team, the Alternative Solutions team, we are making the asset allocation decision. How much should be in real estate? How much should be in infrastructure? How much should be in transportation over time? Uh, and evolving that strategically with the, with the opportunities we see over, you know, uh, ultimately a medium-term time horizon, probably three to five years. We then do have dedicated teams, so a team in infrastructure, a team in transport, and they wake up and all they do day in, day out is live and breathe their portfolios. What sectors do they want to be in? What counterparties do they want to be exposed to? And so what, you, what you'd expect to see with this portfolio over time is both e evolution at the strategic level, um, but also evolution at the underlying asset level, and I'll, I'll talk about both uh, in the next few slides. But ultimately what you can see here on, on the left-hand side is the mix of the strategic mix of the portfolio. At a high level, what we're looking to target is roughly 50-50. So 50% in global private real estate. Importantly for us, because we're looking to be a complement to more UK-centric allocations, that for us is US and Asia Pacific. <clears throat> and then 50% in other real assets, primarily infrastructure and transport. The other part of the portfolio uh, the way to think about the portfolio mix is 
80% in private assets and roughly 20% in public assets or listed real assets to provide some liquidity in the portfolio. And you can see the specific numbers on the right hand side where we're currently exposed a little bit under, underweight real estate uh, given some of the market moves we've seen but also our views are trying to evolve away from some of the real estate allocation uh, and then infrastructure transport. I don't know if there's any water. Oh, there's, sorry. Um, perfect. Thanks. From that, you can pause. Perfect. So, how can this evolve um, strategically? So, here's just some examples of what we've done as a team over the last um, you know, 18 months, two years or so. So, give you some examples. Um, one, in May 22, uh, real estate, or whilst we've had a lot of pain in 2023, did actually have a very, very strong time coming out of COVID. We did feel that the market had gone quite a long way. Um, we did feel that actually we were starting to enter a period where there was going to be interest rate rises. Um, and so we looked to diversify away from real estate equity into the more debt side of things. Um, we've continued that rebalancing throughout 2023, uh, in particular uh, Asia and the US side, and then as you can see the hedging side. And so the portfolio does continue to evolve. Um, and whilst we do feel that actually uh, a lot of the pricing within real estate has come, repricing within real estate has come to an end, um, some of the benefits of infrastructure and transport in terms of their exposure to um, some of the markets that are benefiting from the energy transition. <laughs> So their exposure to asset classes that are benefiting from uh, inflation uh, means that actually that is still an area that we're looking to allocate to. And so that kind of middle point is ongoing. But also importantly, as I mentioned earlier, there, was, there are increasing convictions within the portfolio where underlying teams have looked to increase an in allocation because of a, a longer term trend they're also seeing. So to give you a couple of examples now, you know, when we launched this fund in 2019, you'd have asked me how much we'd have, we expect to be exposed to kind of more liquid natural gas. I'd have said pretty close to zero. It wasn't in the portfolio day one, wasn't really in the pipeline. But actually, late 2019, early 2020, our transport team, so the team investing in uh, shipping, aviation, them types of assets, the assets that literally move, felt there was an opportunity. They felt there was an opportunity because uh, kind of what you see on the left-hand side, the expectation that LNG, liquid natural gas cars, can be an important transition fuel, whilst renewables will take the brunt of it, um, it's difficult to decommission everything in one go, and LNG is a will be an important part of that transition. However, importantly, they didn't really want to, uh, at that time, buy in the second-hand market. They didn't want to go in and buy assets that were already up and running, maybe 10 or 15 years old. And the reason for that was because that we're actually in a kind of position where uh, newer assets were now being built with greater uh, fuel efficiency, utilising better technology. And so actually, um, what you were seeing was the newer assets were actually able to use the LNG they were carrying as a fuel. Uh, and so actually they, the newer assets were going to be up to 60% more fuel efficient. So what the team did was actually put on a number of new build contracts. Um, these assets don't get built overnight. And so whilst we started that in kind of 2019, 2020, they started to get delivered in 2023. And as you can see over that time, we've built up an exposure to 28 LNG carriers, um, which are very, very significant, you know, $200 million uh, a ticket. Um, but because we're utilising on part of that broader platform, um, only roughly 5 to 7% of JARA. So able to get that scale without being overly diversified. And obviously, you know, given what's gone from a geopolitical perspective, the importance of uh, these types of assets have only increased in that time. The other big area that's, that's been increasing is, is utilities. Um, again, left-hand side, this, the broad story that we see here, whilst this is kind of how much people pay for their utility exposure, um, or their utility bills, the grey lines are how much they spend during periods of recession. The, the thing we like about utilities is that generally people continue to pay their bills uh, and need to pay their bills no matter what. Um, the other nice thing about utilities is there is a lot of opportunity to invest behind them and upgrade them as we move towards an energy transition and benefit from these better assets over time. 
Um, we don't actually have any particular exposure in the UK here. We've done it in Europe. We've done it in the US. And it has been an area that um, we've been able to uh, invest capital. We roughly serve over 5 million customers across providing water and electricity uh, across the globe. Um, and the nice thing about this is as more of these assets need to be invested in in order to, I say, decarbonize and meet the energy transition and be part of a decarbonizing grid, um, there's a lot of investment opportunities for us as a platform to continue to invest. Um, so that's kind of hopefully a quick overview, you know, in the 20 minutes or so. Uh, I think I started late, so that one minute might not be for me. Um, so um, but obviously, you know, I want to talk quickly uh, about performance. Um, we did have a, someone's kindly sent across some, some uh, earlier questions, so hopefully covering it in this section as well. Um, now, there are two stories here. There's the NAV and then there's the share price. Um, and in particular, for those following the investment trust market closely, um, in particular, more alternative income investment, uh, real asset funds have had a difficult time from a share price perspective. But quickly, just to start off from an NAV perspective, uh, you know, what you can see, we produce quarterly NAV, so going to the kind of one-year number, um, roughly a flat return over the last year. Uh, and bearing in mind, this is a, a market where interest rates have risen very, very quickly. Um, actually, some markets, particularly some parts of the real, real estate market, have been down 20 to 30%. Um, we feel that there has been some stability in the NAV, um, given the asset mix that we've had. Uh, and given that we, you know, broad consensus is we get it, we are at the end of the, the, the rate hiking cycle uh, with a potential for things to start decreasing now um, or at some point in the year, then that is a more favourable environment for real assets to start performing. Um, there has been a different story with the NAV um, and actually sitting at a particularly wide NAV uh, discount right now in kind of the mid to high 20s. Um, that is quite consistent with what has been uh, across the market for, for real asset investment trusts and alternative income investment trusts. Um, but obviously, you can imagine we are very focused on that um, and we are working with the board about how to narrow that um, significantly uh, going forward. Um, part of our portfolio construction does give us liquidity. So we are not fully invested in private assets that um, can't be monetized quickly. We do have that listed real asset allocation, which we showed in the strategic asset allocation. That's allowed us, or the board in particular, I should say, to do buybacks, done roughly 4% of, of the share capital in, in buybacks, and that is a, an ongoing uh, program. Importantly as well, there is a, a continuation vote. So five years um, after the launch of the fund, we put in that there was a continuation vote um, and for investors to um, obviously can choose to, to wind up the fund at NAV. So JP Morgan has got a good track record of, of doing that and returning capital as and when uh, investors require. But importantly, we hope that with that, that is a clear catalyst for the discount to narrow one way or the other and hopefully provides uh, some clarity for investors around, with, around where the share price can go uh, going forward. But clearly a big focus for the board, big focus for us about how, how we evolve that. Um, summary slide, you know, ultimately what JARA is, uh, is a kind of diversified core real asset allocation. Uh, we are focused on the core end of the spectrum. That means income orientation in what we do. So roughly about 6.5% dividend yield at the moment. Um, low correlation to traditional assets. Very well diversified. And I say, uh, continue to find interesting. We you know, gave just, just two examples within a very d diversified portfolio across things like LNG and, and, and utilities. Um, and obviously, you know, share price at the moment is very dislocated. Board looking to buy back, continuation vote, uh, hopefully in the, in, the me in the medium term. So i.e. June or July, sorry, I should say, um, allows that to narrow as well. And I'll pause there. Um, five minutes less for, for questions, I think. Phil, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. OK. Anybody have a first question? Gentlemen at the back there, please, Steve. Thank you. Where's this one? Am I looking? Uh, hi, you said, oh, you, yeah, you said that you used the Jason Morgan platform. Yes. But I wanted, um, how does your, does your uh, trust differ to the other um, JP Morgan trusts? J, no, the JGGIs, JARA, um, no, the JARAs, I mean, the, sorry, the JAMAs, and, uh, in terms of the methodology. For example, JGGI uses, uses research analysts 
who, who are dedicated and never become uh, portfolio managers. Do you have exactly the same approach as, uh, for example, JGGI, or, or do you have autonomy to do your own methodology? Yes, yeah, so it is, it is slightly different in, the, well, is and it is different in the private markets, but ultimately, you know, the research on public companies is, is, a, is a slightly different uh, beast. But basically, you will have in each dedicated team people that are fully involved in research constantly, um, underwriting the different private assets that they have, but also the existing assets. Difference, difference with the private markets is often you can have control, you can actually sit on boards. Um, and so actually part of being part of the investment process in the private markets is actually the control and the board positions that you can take and therefore the ability to impact change very, very directly. Um, it isn't quite the same as, as the public markets where maybe you're covering you know, several hundred, if not thousands of stocks across the investment universe. The private markets is very much deal flow orientated. When opportunities come up, they'll be underwritten by the investment team. Uh, and then that will, that will lead into, into deal flow. So um, people are dedicated, a bit like JPGI, but um, not different, given the different markets, it's a slightly different model. If that answers it. Oh, question down. Oh, one here, then come to you. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned the quality of the income, and, yeah. and you gave an example that you know um, a number of your assets are linked to inflation. If you could um, expand a little bit on that, I mean, what percentage of the assets are, yeah. are linked to inflation? And also, you you focused a little bit on LNG and um, the income you get from those uh, those uh, those types of investments. Is it related to the shipping rates, or is it related to the commodity price? Again, if you could expand a bit on that, thanks. No, no, fair. So, we would roughly say of the income profile, sixty percent or so has some linkage to inflation. Um, importantly, because we're a global fund, it's not necessarily UK inflation. It depends on where the assets are and, and things like that. Um, that will be, therefore, driving that. And importantly as well, when it comes to inflation protection within the private markets, sorry, within, within uh, real assets, it doesn't all reset at once. So, for example, we've got some assets that have been able to reset already because their contract was up or because um, it was you know, every 18 months and that's already occurred. There are some things like utilities where... You know, in the UK, um, your bills reset every six months in some markets, but actually in the US, it's every three years. And so there's just a bit of a lag in, in how that gets built out. In terms of the contracts on the transportation side, um, we're looking to be a core investor, so we're not really paying the kind of spike or up and down in lease rates or, or kind of the more, let's say, spot market. We're looking to put on uh, leases for about five to 15 years. Um, because you're putting on for quite a long time, we, we often attract slightly higher quality counterparties and the more kind of global operators as opposed to the shipping families. Um, but you do take a bit of a discount for that, but you, then, you don't, then don't have quite as much volatility. You know, if you're putting on kind of one-year contracts, um, you're naturally more beholden to, you know, spikes and troughs in that market. We're doing longer term, and therefore kind of receive more of an average in terms of how we do the contracts. Question here, please. Thank you. You, you said at inception that the the return was approximately two thirds through dividend and one third through through growth. Has that been the same the case over the last year? So is the dividend still covered to that same sort of level? Yes, from an from an income perspective, obviously in the last year what we've had actually because of the depreciation or the kind of mark to markets on the real estate side, uh, what you've seen is you know real estate markets have been down. They're quite interest rate sensitive. Um, so as interest rates have gone up, real estate values have come down. Infrastructure and transportation have continued to kind of perform pretty well, um, pretty much steady state from that perspective. So that kind of flat return is probably a decline in NAV of that kind of 4% that we're producing in income, then paid back from an income perspective to get your total return. So that in that last year, you've seen obviously a very specific um, scenario, but um, so that's still with a broad target over time for that to be achieved as and when you know, things right size. Does that answer the question? So I suppose the, I was confusing cash flows with, with total return. So in ter, do, you, do you look at the underlying cash flows in the, in the portfolio as a coverage of dividend, or is that a separate? Because, because you've got equity, liquid equity exposure, that's not a, that's not a real consideration on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so the, the, the income and, and the kind of... Um, it's had to phrase this right. So um, the, the income profile, that 46, is from a covered income perspective. That's not paid out of capital. 
The liquid real assets does obviously have a bit of a dividend yield, but the private side is producing the majority of that income yield, of which we covered on the four to six that we're, that we're currently producing, which is currently 4.2p per share on an annualised basis, about 6.5% from a, from a <coughs> dividend yield perspective. And those divvies, they're paid quarterly? They're paid quarterly, quarterly yeah. yeah I thought so. Any other questions, please? For Phil, question over here, please, sir. Yeah. Um, Yes, um, my question, I was the person who actually gave you oh. the questions in advance. I'm not quite sure you only answered that sort of partially. Discount one. I mean, clearly, there's a continuation vote at, at the AGM, which is, was last year, was early, early, early August. There is a chance, clearly, that there'll be a vote to discontinue, particularly if the, um, the board doesn't come up with any cunning plan to sort out the discount. Um, Winding up the trust would be complicated given the fact that 80 plus percent are in these private collective um, investment vehicles. Can you give an idea of what the sort of redemption terms for these vehicles are? And I'd also like to know what sort of percentage, there are, you currently I think have five of these vehicles, yeah. what percentage JARA owns of these vehicles and whether they're exclusively JP Morgan vehicles, yeah, yeah. i.e. not sell, sold externally. Thanks. So let me know if I don't hit each of these. Um, so, so of, of uh, platforms, say roughly 100 billion in real assets, uh, of these kind of vehicles that we're using, they're probably are collectively about 80 billion in size. So JARA's 200 million is a very small percentage. Uh, there is not particularly what, there would be not one fund that we're more than 5% of. So we are a small part of the, um, of the bigger pie, which in this case is, is a positive. Um, from a lock-in perspective and how do, how do the mechanics work, um, most of these vehicles have lock-in periods. We are through them lock-in periods. And so effectively, at the next quarterly day after, if there was a discontinuation, we would submit a redemption request and then be filled that redemption request uh, over may, maybe several quarters. There will be some that return capital more quickly. And so it's actually, given we are not holding the assets directly, probably more straightforward that we don't have to go to the market and sell every single one. We are just putting redemptions into the vehicles where we have the rights across the piece and then receiving money back at NAV. So relatively clean from that perspective. Lovely, Phil, thank you very much yep, indeed. Thank you. Thank you, we're out of time there. <laughs>